Hi friends, who do you say God is? We, we, we think of God in many ways, right? Savior and Redeemer, friend, comforter, the way, the truth, the life. We think of Jesus and his many facets and, and the way that the Holy Spirit operates in our life. And we have many images of the Father. And that's great. God is many things because he's infinite. However, can we get God wrong? I think you and I have been around long enough to know that we can get God wrong. Not just the world can get God wrong, but we, even as Christians, can get God wrong. How do we know this? I mean, <laughs> we know it from our own lives, but we certainly know it from scriptures, right? Like um, Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 9, it's uh, verses 18 through 22. And Jesus comes to his most intimate friends and he says, Who do people say that I am? And they say, Well, you, some say you're John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. Wrong. Right? Wrong. I mean, on all three counts, wrong. And what that says to us then is that there were people in Jesus' day who were followers of Jesus who got Jesus wrong. So if people who were walking with Jesus and knew him as a person could get him wrong, is it possible for you and I to get him wrong also? And of course, the answer is absolutely it's possible for us to get him wrong. So one of the ways that we can get him right, I think, is, is in our prayer relationship. It's interesting because in this gospel passage from Luke 9, uh, Luke tells us that uh, Jesus had gone away to a deserted place to pray. And then we find out that his disciples are there with him. And so that means that they're all in prayer together. And so Jesus then asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ of God. Well, Jesus acknowledges that this understanding of who he is could not come from anyone other than his father. And of course, it comes from a context of prayer. While in prayer, Jesus asked his disciples that. So we know, for instance, that one of the ways in which we can get God right is to be in a prayer relationship with him. So there are, in fact, many ways we can get him right. But let's just deal with maybe three of them right now. One, as I mentioned, is, uh, is prayer. I'll, I'll give an example of this. So at our school, uh, we're introducing a new curriculum, a whole new curriculum called the Classical Education Curriculum Model. And part of the uh, Classical Education Curriculum Model is to offer our students, our teachers, our parents, um, more opportunities for prayer. And that's indeed what we're doing. And in fact, like on Wednesdays is, is a good example of that. On one of the Wednesdays, uh, we are calling our students to come uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we spend um, time in Eucharistic adoration where they can pray to God, where they can praise Him, where they can adore Him, where they, where they can sing their songs to Him, where they can just be quiet and listen to Him, speak to them about who He is and who they are in Him. It's beautiful. And they come to know God more and better just for that prayer and his Eucharistic presence. Another Wednesday, uh, we gather with him again, and we pray together as a community the scriptural rosary. And I say scriptural because it's not just us plowing through the rosary as quick, quickly as we can. We take him through all the mysteries as founded in the scriptures themselves. And so, in the context of prayer, we're going to Mary and asking Mary to pray with us and for us to draw us closer to, the Christ, to Christ. And we're doing that in the context of the scriptures too, so that in prayer and through the scriptures, we can get Jesus right in our relationship with him. And then there are even other ways that we are um, helping our children 
have prayer experiences. So a third Wednesday of each month, uh, we do uh, what is called Lexio Divina. So first we're <clears throat> teaching our, our, our teachers how to do it. Um, and as they get more comfortable with it, then they will um, pray with their students um, on the third Wednesdays of each month. And they will pray the uh, Lexio, the Lexio Divina, which means divine uh, reading. And, and, and basically what it is, is it's, it's learning how to pray with the scriptures. So it's one thing to read the scriptures, but it's a whole nother level when we not just read the scriptures, but we pray with the scriptures because we start to encounter the person of the scriptures, Jesus Christ, not just in an intellectual way, but in, in the heart. We encounter him in prayer. And so our teachers and our students are, are learning how to do this. And it's beautiful. These are just three examples of the ways in which we can pray. For us as adults, for instance, we, uh, we need that. We need, you know, maybe we pray at Eucharistic Adoration once a week for an hour, or maybe every morning before we go to work or, or start our day, we spend a little bit of time in prayer, or we pray a scriptural rosary, or um, we go to a podcast, or maybe we go to um, my favorite Catholic app now, which is um, Hallow. Um, and there's all of these led prayers, led uh, by an audio voice. Uh, all the, yeah, the traditional prayers that we know as Catholics, but so many other like meditations, which last for a minute or five minutes or 20 minutes or a half hour, however long you want them to last. And uh, we're being led in prayer. And in those prayers, uh, many and various ways in which we can pray, we, um, <clears throat> we draw closer to Christ. And when we do this on a regular basis, we are far more likely to get Christ right because we're in a prayer relationship with him. And the opposite is true, is that when we're not praying on a regular basis, um, then we open ourselves up to the suggestions of the enemy and also the misunderstandings of the people of our day. Just like in Jesus' day, when the people weren't walking with him in a relationship with him on a regular basis, then they opened themselves up to uh, the misperceptions of who Jesus was. But when we're in that abiding prayer relationship with him on a regular basis, we're far more likely not to get confused by the confusion of other people. And we're far more likely not to allow ourselves to be lied to by the enemy. Uh, I said there's others. So another a way in which we uh, can get uh, Jesus right is knowledge of him. Um, so, uh, one of the, so that fourth Wednesday of each month uh, in school as part of the classical education curriculum, we're giving our kids an opportunity to ask questions about the faith. You know, like even like hard driving questions. And you see that especially as the kids get older from, uh, get older from grade to grade as they advance uh, and, and go up in the grade level. Uh, so they can put in their anonymous questions um, into a box and uh, they can ask away those questions. And that's important too because uh, we need to know as Christians, for instance, that it's okay to have questions about our faith. And it's even okay to have doubt. Um, we know that, uh, that the disciples believe, but it's sometimes doubted in their beliefs too. And so we're just giving our kids an opportunity to uh, seek out knowledge, to seek out uh, the answers to their faith. And, and, and it's, it's having a beautiful effect upon the growth of our children, but also them get more likely to get Jesus right than to get him wrong. And, you know, um, that's the case with us today, too, as Christians, as, as adults. We have to seek out opportunities to make sure that what we know about Jesus is actually right. And one of the best ways to do that, for instance, is to read the scriptures. I can't tell you um, how many Catholics I've run into over the years who have never read the Word of God. They've never read the scriptures. And not just read it from cover to cover, but also read it and, um, and somehow had it explained to them. 
I mean, one of the reasons why Christ founded the church was not just uh, for the Holy Spirit to write the scriptures, but then to always have teachers around who can explain the scriptures. So one of the things I want to suggest to you in this little video today is um, Father Mike Smith. Father Mike Smith has the most popular right now Catholic podcast in the United States. And uh, it, it's called The Bible in One Year. And each day, uh, you about 20 minutes, you have the Bible read to you and explained to you. So he reads a, a bit of the Bible each day. And in the year, he goes for the entire Bible. But he also explains what it is that he's just read. And uh, within one year, you've not only had the, uh, you've read the Bible, just somebody else reading it for you, and you've also had it explained. Because often people say, well, I don't read the Bible because I, I, whenever I read like the Old Testament, I just don't understand it. Well, now there's a podcast for that, right? And my point is, is that um, otherwise, without continually learning as adults, continually learn, learning, we tend to get God wrong. For instance, when our lives go south, and they do, and they will, uh, we'll have experiences where we're, we're struggling. What do we often do? We say this, or we hear other people say this, um, I'm a good person, but bad things have happened to me. And what do they do? They blame God. But God's not to blame. But they don't know any better, because they've never really uh, ongoing made a, an, a realistic effort to learn their faith throughout their days, throughout their years. And so, yeah, it makes sense then that they're going to get him wrong and they're going to blame him for something that he's not to blame for. And then, as to make matters worse, then they use as as an excuse not to practice their faith. So it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a one-two punch. They get God wrong because they're not, they don't know God. And then they use it as a, a, an excuse not to follow God, which then compounds the problems all the more because they get to know him even less and they blame him even more. Now, if we, if we don't know this, uh, if we get God wrong, then here's, well, not only will we get God wrong, but we'll get ourselves wrong and how to be in relationship with him. But if we are constantly, little by little, day by day, week by week, learning the truth about who God is, like the scriptures every day. Or, you know, you can have read to you the catechism every day. That's another example of the catechism in the whole year. Then we will come to know him, but also know him rightly. And this will dramatically affect our lives and our relationship with him and our, how we understand ourselves. And then also how to be in relationship with others. Because guess what? When we get him wrong, then we lead others away from God. Because we lead them away from the God who we've gotten wrong. Right? All right. So another thing is um, experiences. So having, giving ourselves ongoing experiences of God is another way that we can not only get him right, but avoid getting him wrong. Inviting him into the experiences of our life from day to day, like a walk in the woods or out in nature, where we not just do it, uh, you know, take a hike or something like that, but we ask God to be a part of that. So that when we're seeing the beauty of creation, we're noticing the creator himself. Well, that's one way that we can have experiences of God is through his created things. But here's another one I mentioned earlier, suffering. When our lives go south, how many of us throughout that suffering experience, and sometimes multiple times a day, invite God to be a part of our suffering? Because when we don't, and we suffer, then we miss this great, difficult, but great opportunity to experience the God who suffers with us, like on the cross, and who dies with us, like on the cross. But we also miss the opportunities to experience him helping us through our suffering, not always uh, taking away the suffering because uh, he suffered and he said, if you want to follow me, then pick up your cross and, and follow me. But he leads us, just like the Father led him to the resurrection, he leads us to multiple resurrection experiences of comfort, of strength, of faith, of hope, of perseverance, of, of not giving up, 
of persistence and a variety of way, a ways through ex human experiences that we get him right and get to know him. And then therefore we draw closer to him. And not despite the suffering, but in fact in the midst of the suffering. So as we go through the ups and downs of our lives, we can invite God into these experiences. And when we do, we're far more likely than to get him right as we go through our day to day um, and even learn how to need him and what a value that is rather than get him wrong and blame him and then don't even think that we need him because this, if this is how you're going to treat me, God, right? That's interesting. Let me end with this. It's interesting in, in Luke's gospel, um, uh, after Peter gets Jesus right, uh, Jesus then tells Peter and the other apostles not to tell anyone about who he is, the Christ, until the time is right. Why, why does he do that? That just sounds strange to us. Well, because he knows people will get him wrong. So if the apostles went right out and told everybody, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, right? Then what are the people going to do? They're going to come to Jesus and they're going to say, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ, and they're going to try to make him an earthly king. They're going to get him wrong. Now, Jesus needs the time to be able to show him them what kind of king he's going to be. He's going to be a king who suffers with us. He's going to be a king that doesn't overcome Rome through might and, and military and, and, and war, but, but through um, truth, through uh, love, through mercy, through forgiveness, uh, through the power of his grace and his Holy Spirit. That's how he overcomes an entire empire. But it was going to take time for him to reveal that he's going to be a suffering servant, not a triumphant earthly king. And says, don't tell people just yet because they're prone to get me wrong. But then when the time is right and the disciples saw him suffer and rise again, they were able to go out into all the world, to a suffering world, and be able to proclaim Jesus rightly rather than wrongly. And it was what converted the world. That the disciples were in a relationship with Jesus. That they knew him fully and rightly. That they had multiple experiences of him. And that they could pray to him on a regular basis. Like Jesus taught them how to pray to the Father. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to them. Uh, so that they could be filled with the Holy Spirit when they pray. And then once he died and rose again and ascended into heaven, they, they could pray to him on a regular basis, like in the Eucharist, when they offered Mass. And that's what converted the world. Well, that's what's going to convert us on an ongoing basis, because we're all in need in, on an ongoing conversion. And that's what's going to help us reconvert the world to Jesus Christ. But we'll never be able to do it if we don't have a regular prayer relationship with him, if we're not doing ongoing knowledge of him, and if we don't allow ourselves to have multiple experiences of him throughout the day. But if we do allow all those things, then all the people that we're concerned about in our lives who have walked away from him, mostly because they don't get him right, will never be able to reach them. And our hopes for them will never be able to realize, be realized. But if we do all these things, then we'll be able to do all of these things and more for them, let alone allow God to do these things for us. Till next time, friends.